There we go. We're recording now. We're recording. It happened. Hey. Why did I notice now Welcome. and not like an hour later? Yeah, that would have been upsetting. Welcome, Boom Bunny. We're so happy that you're here. I made it home in time. Hype night. Uh, as always, if you'd like to support this show and our other creations, we'd love for you to join us on Patreon. Uh, you can find our us at patreon.com slash Grove Guardian Press, where we've just added some fiction tiers. And we're super thankful for our patrons for sponsoring us and encouraging us to try new things like this show. Um, and it's, I don't know, I, one of my favorite things about our Patreon is that it's a really like special interactive space where we get to uh, do a little bit more like one-on-one -on -one and answering people's questions and things like that. And so that's always really, really fun. Yeah. Oh my. We got a full house tonight. We got Ooh, we're Penny so sparkles popular. and boom bunny and zeke oh my goodness so honey mm -hmm. our our topic for tonight fantastic locations vibrant settings mm -hmm. here we go here we go you need me to start yeah okay so i thought it would just for like setting the groundwork why are locations, however we're defining them, important to the tabletop experience? Do they, I mean, what do they add? Because we're just kind of imagining this thing in our heads collectively, especially in a one on one game. Like how important are settings, environments and why? Um, for me, when I think about vibrant settings and locations and, and all that good stuff, that is that is setting the stage like so much time and energy and effort and time goes into dreaming up these amazing, incredible, cool characters with rich backstories and mm -hmm. you're pouring over multiple source books to find just the right combination of uh, rules and, you know, pushing the limits of what your DM might allow or find overpowered. And th there's so much that goes into character creation, but without places to go and people to interact with and things to do, they're just, you know, just kind of a, a cool mental image, you know? So like setting mm -hmm. the stage for me with a vibrant setting um, and an interesting environment to, to run around in is super important. I mean, your, your cool character has to have stuff to do, whether it's, um, whether it's interacting with an interesting a different culture than they're used to or or um, finding and fighting or bef befriending fantastic beasts or surviving in strange environments like all the stuff that the characters get to do is you know going to be that's the that's the set piece that's you know they're running around on the stage Oh, I like the stage better. I was thinking about, so we've been watching the Great British Baking Show because it's relaxing and fun. GBBO. So it's like the, you know, if you're having a fancy cake, the setting is like the cake, the fanciness. Everything goes on top of it, but you have to have it. Otherwise, you just have icing and decorations. Maybe. Maybe. I, I am having trouble relating it to, like, so you mean like the foundation? So like the adventure is the whole cake. The whole ex yeah, the, the game whole experience is like game the whole experience. Thing. And then okay. Sure. Um so I was going to say thinking about this question of why it's important. Um for me that it's creating an immersive setting. I really like for the place where the game is happening to feel like a character itself for it to be very vibrant and lively and to have things going on. That's one of my favorite parts of writing for D and D. I try to add that into anything that we're publishing because I want to set the DM up for the player feeling really immersed in the environment. That's one of my favorite parts of as a, as a player too, of like feeling totally connected to and kind of taken away into this pretend space uh, but I feel like that's something that I do better like writing and setting up than I do when I'm like DM 
that mm. thing. And maybe that's like, I don't know how true or realistic that is. That could just be like a difference in my, my head, but, um, when I'm planning an adventure that we're like publishing, I can, you know, create the random encounters, craft the box text really carefully, hint at the emotions of the space and kind of add in tiny details along the way. But on, when I'm like opposite you at the table, I'm so excited about the adventure that we're having. Or like even when I'm prepping, there are like so many big things. And I feel like setting, even though it's so important, sometimes I don't spend as much time on or maybe it just doesn't come across like as fully as I as I want it to and so part of why we're having this conversation is because I wanted to talk about it and so um as usual like we're learning and growing as players and dms all the time too like we don't have all of the answers but hopefully at the end of this session Buck has all the answers, answers but he's not telling um, anybody it's a secret he's too busy with his chew bone to like reveal everything yeah Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Um, can I say I was so grateful to be. Well, like I love I generally just period. I love that you and I play D&D &D together. Um, we have, a you know, such a rich, vibrant one on one game. That's super fun. But especially this year this strange very claustrophobic at times year like you and i got to run around and experience fantastic locations and see and do incredible things and talk to all kinds of different people all while locked down very much mm -hmm. you know sheltering in place from a global pandemic and so like the I think that that's something that's super special. Like, that's something that's super special about one-on-one -on -one D and D is if you're playing with the person that you live with, then you can experience places and do things that just otherwise wouldn't be possible. And I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Or somebody you can call really easily, like when you both want to play and you're not having to juggle a whole bunch of different schedules. I think that that works really well too. Yeah. yeah. We had so many festivals this past year. Yeah, it would be like a couple of days and then our characters are suddenly at another festival dancing and playing games. Thank goodness. Um, I was just going to say too really fast, like I thought it was interesting. So early in the pandemic, we switched. I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but we switched which campaign that we were doing mm. to a more lighthearted campaign. And I was going to talk um, later in our session thinking about the kind of mood or atmosphere that seems to fit different characters, regardless of where they are. Um, like Berseris could be on a sunny, happy, relaxed island and she's still going to be like kind of grouchy to be there. Um Elliot's narrative tends to have like quite a bit of weight to it. And so like switching to Persephone Rainier running around made so much sense during a like globally stressful time because like Persephone is going to bring light and lightness wherever it is that, that she's going. She's going to have a good time while she's there, even when things are like very, very dire. And so that's something I wanted to kind of add into this conversation is that wherever you're putting the character, uh, we talk about things revolving around the PC, the PC is going to bring their own flavor and like their own feelings and emotions to that particular space. And so, especially on the DM side of things, like you can trust your player to like bring their half of the emotion to the table. It's not like all on you. Yeah. So honey, where do you want to start our conversation um, about locations? <sighs> I thought that we could talk about the different types of locations, which I at first thought might be kind of boring. But then as I was listening to them, I was like, no, this is really interesting and important. OK, here we go. <laughs> um, so these are not both. Eng well, we were both English teachers. This is not like official terminology. So don't nobody run away with this. But um, I was thinking about different types of places that we craft for our games. And then I became really impressed with all the DMs everywhere because 
we're making so many different places. So I was thinking about locations as in cities, towns, kingdoms, settings. And this for me is more about like a mood. So a dark fantasy, medieval, are you in a fairy realm? Are you in like the shadowlands and then environments, a desert, forest, or like a tavern. And so I thought we could talk about mm. those and maybe add some examples. I would love um, friends in the chat if you have a favorite like environment or setting or like a kind of place where you gravitate to as a storyteller. That would be really cool. We'd love to hear. Um, and and so, I love the agreement in chat that dogs know everything. Yeah. Obvs. So you're thinking about location more like literally where is this adventure taking place and then settings is like what's the vibe mm -hmm. what's the mood of the place and then environment is like kind of what is the ecosystem of the place and how those mm -hmm. can intersect in interesting ways to the ecosystem or like what tropes are involved so like are we in the desert? And so we're going to be like setting those expectations or like, are we starting our adventure in a fantasy tavern? Because that's going to be just as much an environment. That's really easy for your player to tap into. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to say about location, city, towns, kingdoms? Did these distinctions make sense? No, I get it as like a, this okay. is where something is happening. This is the vibe mm -hmm. of something. And then this is like the, I don't know what is the word trope or yeah. That's what I've been thinking about it as a, as a trope and, and getting rid of the distinction between like natural and constructed mm. um, because of course they're going to be going together. But if we back up to locations, especially as in like a political or kind of destination type of sense, um, so I like to think of locations as, for me, that's where I tend to plan a narrative arc around. So right now in Tales of Eldura, in prepping this arc, I prepped, you know, what is in Tilvane, and then that was kind of the skeleton onto which I cast the narrative. So I mm -hmm. have the city, I know kind of who is there and what's going on, and what I want the characters to figure out there, and then I can kind of craft plot that point so for me location is a lot about creating a political structure we'll have some sort of social organization that will vary depending on the size of the place um but i think some questions there to think about when we're planning locations are what are the power structures like and how do they align with the pc and the villain or some sort of opposing force um, as well as thinking about your goals for the region's place and the overarching narrative of the campaign um, and can I add something really fast before I forget? Yes. Oh, what I think is so cool that we can do with settings is create a sense of urgency for the characters that emphasizes their agency in the world. So having to choose between going to two different places, for example, should feel like a really weighty choice, not just like, okay, we'll go here and then we'll go here. Like we're not going on two different vacations, but like you can go to help one of two places and events are going to continue to transpire in this other place regard like if you're not there and so like you're choosing you're asking the player to choose kind of which thing is more important and so those i think that the in between in between place narratives can be really really difficult but i also mm. think that those types of choices are really important um and so like push through those like we have a hard i feel like we have a hard time every single time that happens of like uh this page just starts to kind of drag the dm needs time to prep like those in betweens are just a little bit hard the transitions are um but when you're like into a place or choosing a place having those stakes be really really high because then um, that in that choice, the PC is setting their priorities for what it is that they're going to do. And ideally in an active world where you have like some sort of really big villain, the PC not doing something is going to have consequences for the people who aren't being helped. And it doesn't mean that they have to like, it doesn't have to be apocalyptic, but something is going to happen when yeah. they're not there. And when we think about, um, part of making a like a vibrant setting or location for your if we think about it as far as this is the place whether it's a city town or kingdom that this adventure arc is happening 
that city town or kingdom comes with it those power structures that mm. that are uh you know part and parcel of the I don't know, political structure or the, you know, everything that goes into making that place a city is a structure that the characters are interacting with. And so kind of with the, by setting, I had it, I had it all figured out. So like by, by, by having the adventure arc, um, kind of centered around a city town or kingdom, they're interacting with one particular structure uh, of power. And then when they're done interacting with that structure of power, they've done everything that they can do. Then it's, you know, kind of time to move on. I, I don't know. That's, that's a big part of D and D right. Is like typically any tabletop role-playing game, you're going to have a lot of movement from place to place. Do you think it depends on the fantasy genre? I was going to say, yeah. And and it kind of the, that depends a little bit too on the tier of play. You know, mm -hmm. like think about like Waterdeep Dragon Heist. You're, you're all in Waterdeep, but even inside Waterdeep, I would argue that those various wards themselves kind of represent the smaller kind of location changes, but mm -hmm. less so the power structure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I have a point, but I think it's I think it makes sense to organize a particular campaign centered around a city, town or kingdom that when that is dealt with, then the natural thing to do is to transition. Um, well, like Boom Bunny said in the chat, the urban landscapes are familiar to most players. And that's part of what I think is so special about Waterdeep. I love that they kept the campaign small um, because the setting feels, at least like when we've played, I know you did a lot of prep for that game, but the setting feels so real and vibrant because cities are huge. Like you could have a level one through 20 adventure and never leave like whether we're looking back in like the, the medieval period or like whatever period we're pulling from, we could have really incredible adventures without having to go very far. Um, but I do think more commonly we tend to move. Yeah. Or at least that's the stories that maybe we're used to seeing more. I don't know. I think that would be something I'd be interested to see, like how does that track or change over time as well as like what size world are we starting with and that's something like with us working on this time rod campaign or like for me working on the novels like i want the world to feel big but it it's only going to feel so big because like you're just a few people kind of operating inside of the world and so then like through these more narrow perspectives i think that shifts and shapes like how large a place feels um and that this is like skipping ahead a little bit but that was something i was thinking about a lot um like how much do we and i mean this is of course up to individual preference but how much do we lean into existing tropes because that makes it easier for us to kind of have a jumping off point and that's less work for everyone at the table to do like okay this is a dark fantasy kind of like Van Helsing and so then like we know the mood and it's easier to add things in from that point because we're tapping into an existing foundation and how much does it need to feel super super new yeah and I think those um those tropes and like if you just set the vibe like you just have van helsing i immediately had i immediately was in a place i don't know that at the table you could ever convey all of the tiny little things that make that setting but if you if you can lean on those tropes then that can fill in a lot of the color for you and invite the player to imagine for themselves you know the details that they would need to think of to fit that setting mm -hmm. so they could just pull from the things that are kind of like the most relevant to them yeah and that they know about you know if i say mm -hmm. um if i say okay this is a western kind of thing then you know you're immediately dropping in the tumbleweeds and the cactus and the spittoon right like that's 
or I am, you know, but like I would say Western and you might think of some other small details that are, um, I guess the details are kind of the point and kind of not the point. Mm -hmm. Well, like you don't need so many that you don't, we don't want to miss the whole picture for sheer number of details that like the players just zoned out because you've been describing the setting for five minutes. Let me read you my treatise on the inner workings of the body politic of the. Yeah, it's not good. Just introduce them to somebody who talks like that and you're there. Right? Totally. And I think too, like Pinterest is your friend here. Like it's okay to like, if you're trying to introduce a character to a space, um, you know, these are some of the visuals that you would see. There's a um, campaign that they just finished the, the Kickstarter, but it's called The Lost Druid. And I can't remember the publishers right now, um, but they have added like music and visuals so that they're um, basically to the campaign. We froze. Theater of the oh. mind, but they've added this really cool way of kind of in session immersion. Is it? Oh, we froze for a second, or at least mine did. Oh. I think we're fine. Oh, good. Okay. It's like, and then. <laughs> I missed the last um, thing you said because it was, it was frozen on my side, but I don't know if it was frozen for anybody else. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if it was frozen, everybody, or if I'm repeating myself. Um, I was talking about the the Lost Druid campaign that was recently on Kickstarter that looks so cool, where they have, like, it seems to me like it's meant to be, like, have images that you're putting up on a TV or something for the location. Mm. And then in the, um, and they have, like, specific music that they've composed for the setting but then the combat aspects are meant to be more theater of the mind and so i thought it was interesting to kind of lean on um like audio visual aspects kind of differently than we might normally think about for a, a D, D campaign um so i'm excited to try that out and see kind of what it's what it's like yeah that's something that um i think that I mean, I wish that I utilized that a little bit more like uh, the available, like there's so much amazing atmospheric environmental fantasy art on Pinterest or the internet. And it, especially if I like find something that's just the, just the thing and just show it to you real fast, then that's, that can definitely help create a sense of location. Mm -hmm. You did that for that one picture in Beresov where the um, blood letters have captured watchers that are just kind of like, just kind of hanging above the city in that horrifying way. Like the um, show we watched, I don't know, like the Orlando Bloom show where they're like with the fairies. Yeah, it Carnival starts Row. Off and you see, yeah, and you see people just like stuck in, is horrifying. Yeah set up a very horrifying space immediately yeah i need to remember to do that more i i i feel like i'm pretty good about that when we're fighting something i'll like describe it and then i'll be like and then it's got a hooks for hands and it looks like this which i think is helpful the but, right there yeah. <laughs> i think it's helpful um so is there anything that we wanted to say? oh can i come back to well no i'll skip ahead so what do you think about for different, how can we set different moods? Um, I thought Boom Bunny's point in chat about the Forgotten Realms um, being kind of the default setting was um, was really interesting because like we have this huge space where at least in, term, in 5e and they have like a teeny sliver like of the Sword Coast. Like if you look at here's this whole huge world and we have little details about places like Cormier, which is massive. It's like five times the whole of the Sword Coast. And yet we have entire campaigns set in just like one city or one part of one city. Mm -hmm. And I think that that. That scale aspect is really important to keep in mind because like we don't you don't have to have the whole world set up. Um, or know everything about it in order to like to start your campaign or for your campaign to feel really vibrant. That's something um, early on, like 
I tell my students that are in D and D club that are super excited about running their, you know, setting their first campaign up and they're, you know, writing their own stuff. Um, I made the good early decision of making a little region, but I followed it up with a decision that I wish I hadn't, um, of, like, and this is the world map. And I just thought too small about it, you know? And if I had it to do again, I'd be like, and this is the two known major continents, right? Uh, just to have more space. And we've since kind of figured that out. Um, but I, I think it's, I think it's a rather common mistake to think that the world as setting needs to be figured out or totally explored and known or that anybody would have that kind of knowledge, especially if we're dealing in a fantasy space. There's mm -hmm. life. Life is so dense. There's so much of it in such a relatively small space that I think it's important to remember that so much can happen just with, just with this. Uh, and not to mention planes of existence are interconnected with one another. Not even going there. Throwing in some more wrinkles. <laughs> um, so if we're looking at the settings, like in terms of, so for me, settings are about, mood and about setting up like how does this particular place feel um and so speaking of feelings i i think one piece of advice that is common for D, &D writers and i think for gms as well is to not tell the pc how they feel so for example you see a giant spider and a twinge of fear ripples down your spine that's like not best practice instead we want to think about how can we describe the spider in such a way that it inspires a feeling of fear in the pc so like how do we set how do we like go about setting up the sentence and trusting the player to do the work of reacting to the scenes that we're setting up but then when we're thinking about the setting for me especially when we're thinking about immersion we're taking a step back before the spider is there so we're, we're prepping it the spider is going to like kind of arrive here so then your question as the storyteller or at least my question is the storyteller is how do i set up a space with such a sense of foreboding um with you know any number of things hiding in the shadows that it's almost a relief as well as terrifying when this spider shows up because any number of things could have popped out of the shadows and so it's like just like in a horror movie when you're waiting for the jump scare and then it finally happens, you're like, oh, thank goodness. And then you have to wait for the next one. Uh, That's like if you're going for that sense, how do you set up the setting? Um, if you're trying to make the player feel on edge and make the PC feel on edge, how do you set that up in advance? Um, and so that's to me one of the really interesting questions that we get to play with with setting. Um, it doesn't have to be the monster that's scary. It's being out of place in, a, in an environment that you don't know that's not friendly towards you that is so scary i think leaning on the senses for all of that too um and describing you know the there's that um persistent drip 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 in the corner and an eerie creaky hinge that just no you can't use eerie i can't use eerie oh mm -hmm. because i'm describing how the creaky hinge is eerie how they feel it yeah i disagree <laughs> you'd immediately know what i meant and i think that's the point right like clarity in what you're going for, I think is good. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying if we're trying to follow this rule, if you already have the eerie sense set up, and so then they hear that, and think, oh my gosh, somebody's here. It's a ghost. It's time to leave. I don't know what they think it is, but <laughs> I think that's the challenge of of setting and not using that emotional language. I totally, love squeaky things. I totally get not saying 
your character feels afraid of this space. Mm. But I feel like as a DM, it's like there's so much that goes in. I think it's a worthy challenge to set up a setting in such a way that you're describing in which you don't use any of that language. However, I do think that our characters have access to so much more information and data about the world that way more than you could ever, ever possibly describe in any kind of reasonable way at the table that it's okay at times for the DM to amalgamate some of the stuff that they would be taking in that you can't sit there and convey for 45 minutes. Like it, it would almost be like reading the second chapter of um, Fellowship of the Ring with uh, Tom, Tom Bombadil. Bombadil. Oh my gosh. Too much, man. Too much. Get some like hate mail for that one. But yeah, well, I, you know, I will. That I will argue the literary non-merit of that particular chapter until, well, until I find something better to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll move on. Um, I, I totally get that. And DMs plays. I'm not saying we should like police DMs language for like, oh my gosh, you used an emotion word. I just ah. wanted to be like, it's so easy for them to slip in that that challenge of, um, that challenge of like not using them it like you just kind of peel back layer after layer after layer of those emotion words that i think can be really powerful um yeah there's a reason he's not in the movie <laughs> <laughs> um so for environments um i did want to take a second for us to recognize like different types of environments and so this was again where my question was like do we lean into tropes how much do we lean into tropes how much do we not lean into tropes so like as one example um Briseris going into the ring of light we talked about this a couple episodes ago i think um but being asked to cover her here like it's game like I mean, she lives like that town was already burned down. I just didn't know it yet. She lives on the edge of like, oh, anyway, but I thought that that was so interesting. And it's like, you know, it's not how we normally start a campaign. Like you often start with like creating some sort of home base. This like first place where she arrives. She, I mean, she hates and is like, you know, this is exactly the opposite of where she's trying to be, not what she's looking for. Um, and like we're working on the intro narratives for the Land of Vampires campaign, but we just kind of jumped in and started. I think I can't remember what level we were. Maybe it was one, maybe it was three, but we just kind of leapt in to the narrative and went to the Ring of Light soon after burned it down. But anyway, that doesn't matter. That was but such I a was good like, thing for how... that setting, you know, like this is not a safe yeah. place. This is not a welcome place. It's not nice here. And so was that your goal as the DM to like set up that sense of you should be on edge. This is a dangerous place for you to be. Yeah, I wanted to subvert that exact kind of thing that you're talking about how usually there's like oh here's this thing we might solve there's some rats in the basement that need clearing out and now we have a safe place where we can nope this person is a spy and this person is accusing you of this terrible thing and your this party member is getting kidnapped and yeah it's just this is not a nice place to be i was yeah. really glad that we had a conversation before we started that campaign about what kind of campaign that we were going to be playing and that I was interested in running like because our other campaign, you know, the the animal companion is going to be fine. The dragon could breathe on their little forehead and the, the guess what magical magical puppy. It just it just uh, it actually absorbs the flames and that's one of its abilities. She can breathe fire. She can breathe fire now. So like and it was just a different vibe. And so I wanted to see what like a 
a darker game would be like. And if we were going to do it, let's do it. Mm-hmm. The Ring of well, Light. To be fair, beer was always going to be fine, too. Yes, but your companions not necessarily <laughs> going to be fine. Exactly. That's true. They're not as important as Vera. <laughs> Um, so I thought we could talk about ways to make things feel more immersive. And there's kind of like the classic music, um, candles. You all know that we love cantrip candles. Oh, yes, honey. Can we circle back around to tropes some more? Because I think yeah, tropes I for kind of skip locations are super good. And like you should use them when you are describing like as the dm when you're describing the vibe of a place and you're communicating something that feels a little tropey that again is another cue for the player to like populate that mental space Mm -hmm. in a way that your words could never fully populate but if you lean on the trope then they know what to bring to the table. Oh, this is what we're talking. Okay, right? Like I, I can, I, I can fill that in more holistically than you would ever be able to describe at the table. Mm-hmm. That being said, you don't have to stay there. I think that's a good place to start. Like, how often as people do we go into a space or a situation and we're like, oh, it's this, and then we find out that. It's actually more complicated than that. There's more going on. Um, That's a normal everyday experience for us. We're like, oh, it's this. And then things get more nuanced and detailed and Mm -hmm. subvert our expectations. And if you can do that with your settings too, then you've more approximately realized what it means to really be in a space. Like, oh, this feels this way, but it's really more subtle than that. And this is different than I expected that's doing your that's you're doing your players a favor if you use the tropes and then kind of add in the details and wrinkles and subversion of expectations Uh, i love that i think one of my favorite ways that that happened in our campaign was when we were in um hammerfell the dwarven kingdom and you had these five families set up um, one of whom was over farming. And so they had this very technologically advanced system of subterranean light for crop growth. And they had these funny like cow bison I, and like there was so much space underground. And so for me, that was like taking a fantasy trip that I've seen before that has always been relatively simplistic and immediately complicating it making it more nuanced and more varied and so i think with tropes we're talking about like you're in a you know an elven forest um or or you're in a classic fantasy tavern the bartender leans on the bar what do you have and whatever that is like um i just wanted to be specific about the the type of trope that we're talking about like one you can fall into easily that's not harmful or hurtful to others. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I just need to preach about tropes for a second. I, think, I thought that was awesome. It's a good word. And, and that I love that as the space, like you use that to set the groundwork and then add in, elements of surprise or nuance kind of as as needed or as as wanted and i think that that can be really fun and surprising and and let the player add some of that in too like how the character interacts in that space like just remember that you're not alone in creating the setting especially in a one-on-one game it's a conversation um so there will be like this happens to me in Tales of Eldura where I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, I finally found a character that's going to like help Gareth out and he's going to like really like them. And Gareth I is am. like, this person's being really mean to me. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> um, yeah, we found a friend for you this last week. I thought that was really exciting. Renej? Um, no, I was talking about Aventurine, but Renej too. Oh yeah, I like Aventurine too. Yeah, you don't like Renej. I like Renej. I think, I think she's kind of scary. Like I, I, yeah, she is. Yeah, I think I, Gareth likes teasing um, Evelyn about Renege. 
that. Evelyn's hard to tease, so I think that works out pretty well. You want to talk about methods for making settings feel real? Make it feel real. Bringing them into the stories. So ambient music like Sirenscape or a video game soundtrack um, or something that's more mood based. So I have um, or like a couple of special sessions I've made playlists for some of my characters. I have playlists and I also have some like mood based like um, a dark druid quest. Um, some of those I've created for writing, but I'll still pull from for our campaigns. And so um Sometimes musically, it's like, okay, we've got, I can't listen to like a dungeon-y sound, like a dripping. Uh, I just can't handle it. Um, the dogs get so really upset very long. if we play yeah. like some of the classic like haunted house stuff with yeah. the creaking or like bird. muffled voices or birds. Mm -hmm. the dogs go crazy. Yeah. So our our home music has tended to be more mood based. I can just see his little, his little back feet. And he's such a he's character. He's mostly asleep. But when I was talking about him just now, he just had a big stretch and a, a snort. So. So what do you think about that? Um, also scented candles, like um, for cantrip candles. And sometimes we've done, we, we've talked about this, the um, Christmas one that we rewrote as um Shoot, now I'm forgetting the name of it. It's, a, it's a one with oh, a really long it's no title. place like home. Yeah, thank you. Um, where we like created the log, we did the log on Netflix. Yeah, the Yule log. With a bunch of candles. It was really cute. That's that sticks in my mind is a really fun special memory. Mm -hmm. When I was writing to our patrons earlier today about this session, I said that like, you always do really cool things for our boss fights. There's usually a location change. You have like an elaborate map um, and you use like props around our house. So they'll like have this like mound that they're like doing their large speech from that has like a, a lamp. Like, this is the pillar of the temple, you know, and then we've got little candles, which if you're this big as one of the many is even a like the size up from a tea light is huge. Um, so that's really scary. The multi level, we had the coffee table was like one map and then the bigger table was the other map. And there was like two mm -hmm. different levels of craziness going on. And we're like running around and had the chairs everywhere and had to go like back to the character sheets. That was a little involved for me. Awesome. <laughs> Memorable. <laughs> yeah. That was when we were still doing the crazy. We have full character sheets for a yeah, party of too many eight people manage. or something crazy. We haven't worked figured out since then. A lot of parties. Um, well, I was going to say food and drink can be really special here, too. Whether that is like that you are eating or that your characters are eating. So um, when we were in the Dwarven Kingdom, you had created this really sweet gnome with this very special restaurant that was like these really intricate, interesting creations. That was like such a unique thing for the characters to experience at this like they find dining at this kind of like regular ish. Thing that was nothing like they'd ever experienced before, not something that I had encountered in fantasy before. And I thought that that was, was really special. That was fun. Um, that was one of the times where it was a matter of kind of like adding a, adding, adding an unexpected wrinkle or detail. You know, you think of like Dwarven fare as being very robust and hearty um, and this gnome is interested in making very fine, exquisite patisserie and fancy cocktails and, and things like that. That was a fun little subversion. Uh, um, I think too, like letting little details work to set up bigger things. So is it a highly religious area? What are some clues that might help the PC recognize that pretty early on? Um, Consistent iconography and symbols and yeah um do people wear like are do a lot of people wear a certain type of necklace do you see certain types of rings or like what is the identifying factor how many temples are there is there one on every corner 
to lots of shrines. Um, I played a um, cleric of Sune for just a little bit in a, in a short campaign, but reading about the worshipers of Sune, one of my favorite details was that they'll like take these little like mobile shrines with them where they have like makeup and mirrors and perfume and stuff. And they'll just like leave them in places where people don't have access to those things so they can kind of beautify and then move on. And that was like such an exquisite detail to me. Like it was such a small thing, but it was really fun for my character to like arrange her little silver fantasy caddies and like hang it up somewhere and then go about telling more people about how cool Sune is. She's <laughs> very calm and nice. And yeah. yeah. Um, same thing with like, with what's the guard presence, like how at ease do shopkeepers seem? Um, how easy is it to get a room? Is this, is the area really crowded? Are they used to receiving visitors? Um, what types of goods are available? Are they priced? you would expect them to be? Are they more expensive? So any of those sort of small things can do a lot to set up an area. Um, So like, say you have a tyrannical king who's, you know, we're in a Robin Hood situation and they're like just taxing the populace in an out of control manner. Um, The PC having easy access to gold to stay at the end might, that might be surprising. Maybe somebody wants to barter with them for goods or services or you know any any of those sorts of things i think are um even just a little bit can can go a really long way yeah the setting conveys so much about what the characters can expect you know it's it's kind of a matter of showing and not telling instead of saying oh things are really desperate in this city instead describing people in distress and you know the shops are boarded up or you know mm-hmm. there's broken glass in the windows and the smudged faces of the starving babes and, you know if that that puts a character that makes a character understand things that are much more interesting than oh you walk by a man Talking about the situation, three hundred years ago, Lord Farquaad took our things. And now, or even like maybe the the PC walks in and nobody really looks at them. Like people are so kind of downtrodden and tired from from their work and their kind of day to day that don't really want to interact. And so, so that way, you give the player some space to misinterpret what's going on or differently interpret what's going on um, so that then they have a chance to kind of get into some of those layers. Yeah. Well, uh, so with our last little bit, I thought we would ask friends in chat if you guys have any questions or anything that you want to discuss, any favorite settings that you wanted to tell us about, that would be really cool. Can I say Um, one more thing about settings? Yeah. With fantasy settings, don't be afraid to go big and re- like go big. You know, maybe there are, I mean, just as far as like size is concerned, you can have incredible, huge things happening that just like that's the way it is. So don't worry about it. There's magic. Right. Like I'm thinking about uh, a city on the back of a turtle. I'm thinking about um, a a place that's on the precipice of an impossible chasm. The chasm descends down into the center of the earth. Right. Like um, I'm talking about uh, we, we had a really fun battle in the door we keep talking about the dwarven place uh with our setting conversation which makes me feel very happy pat pat but like uh, we had a really cool battle that was inside of a impossibly huge geode and the light from the spells were reflecting in the crystals inside the geode where you were fighting this basilisk or whatever um i just think that it's okay to swing big uh when you're describing those like big set piece moments like if a a character is looking out across a landscape and they have a wide field of vision 
pepper in things, even if they don't interact with them later, that convey something really impressive and awe-inspiring about that location. That's really interesting advice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. Um, so I did want to say for our next episode on the 23rd, um, we are going to be talking about scaling combat. And on the 30th, I believe we're talking about running a D&D club at school since we have that as a request. I know that's not specifically duet related, but I thought that that would be like good a good point to to work that in and we've talked about scaling combat before but we don't have like a dedicated video specifically to scaling combat so please do send us your questions as i know it can be a really complicated topic and so we would love to get into the nitty-gritty about it and if we need to have a second session about it later we can do that too that sounds good that is one of the more frequent converse like questions that we get and I think that I think that that unnecessarily prevents a lot of people from trying one on one D&D because it seems like the mathematics of it or the, the design of it is going to be too cumbersome because it's not made for it. You know, like the CR system mm -hmm. relies on having a party of four to six. And um, it can be it can be daunting, but it's really not that too, it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I keep having that trouble in our Tales of Eldura game because things keep getting like, I'll pick a CR that's appropriate, you know, or that, I mean, that most people would say like, this is, it's too hard for them. And then like, if we got a party of three spellcasters, so it, there doesn't seem to be a medium, a medium ground. It's like, here are some things and we termed it and sent it away. I vanished it. <laughs> Let's leave. Or, Let's leave it Hurry. or Gareth rolls 15 sub 10 rolls of the dice and almost dies and almost dies or does die and his relentless endurance happens two times uh boom bunny in the chat says no, i find using stumbling into the fey wild is usually a good break and lets you have really interesting alternative mm. forests yes i think that's such a good point i like the whoop there you are somewhere else I like um, and it's such a nice change of pace. Yeah. I love going to the Feywild. And you can get a, you can get by with, you know, a Feywild adventure that's funny or you can get by with one that it can still be a very good Feywild adventure. That's kind of scary with, you know, lycanthropes and uh, the mm -hmm. dark Fey. Um, yeah, it's a good opportunity too to like color in a lot of interesting details improbable things surprising things mm -hmm. uh, and like that's another one of those places where the the player or i'm sorry where the pc can like feel kind of out of place but it really opens up the world a lot because it's just so different from their day-to-day -day. um like fairy portals pop up literally everywhere. That sounds amazing. I so like to, I mean, time. yeah, your character can just be like innocently taking a rinse in a forest spring. Boom. They're in the Fey Wild. Uh, are there portals to like a, short, a sort of shadow realm that are equally available because i think that that would be really exciting and really scary <laughs> like you think oh, i'm gonna, just gonna run through this rainforest nope oh i accidentally stepped into a shadow ah. now i've got a sorrow sworn twizzling my entrails and its hooks it loves me sorrow sworn are so cool i love them so much there's they're one of the more interesting like mechanically interesting creatures in the standard D D like the the wizard of the coast D D of the official wizard of the coast creatures sorrow sworn are some of my favorite that's in morning kind isn't it i think so yeah because morning is our favorite yeah 
we liked Volos, but these variations for the more common creatures that are in the monster manual is a little bit less exciting than demon lords, wait, demon princes and arc devils and sorrows. Well, more. We got Mordenkainen's and then I didn't like it as much. Yeah, pink sparkles. It was the wrong kind of mushrooms in the fairy circle, and now I'm in the shadow world. <laughs> you got to be careful. I thought I could start that side, but no. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be a really exciting mistake. Or like it's a fairy port. It's a portal of the Feywild most of the time, and then in a new moon, it's a portal to the shadow realm. Love it. Or from your Feywild romp, you end up in Shadowfell, and then surprise. Huh. Oh, you're trying to go back through the mushroom ring. Mm-hmm. It's not the same one that you thought it was. It's not the same one. It was where you came in, but it's not how you exit. It's a trick. It's a trick. All right, honey. I think it's time for ice cream. Okay, I think so too. Friends in chat, thank you so much for hanging out with us. We super appreciate it. Patrons, thank you for sponsoring us and our stream. And thank you, friends on YouTube, for watching. Um, Please like and subscribe, whether YouTube, Twitch, whatever the happy buttons are below. (laughs) Something loud is happening next to me. Oh, no. Uh, I'll be fine. That's good. If you enjoy our work, then consider supporting us on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com slash Grove Guardian Press, where our lovely patrons support our work. Um, they get all kinds of good D&D stuff um, every month, specifically designed for one-on-one D&D. Right now, we are in the midst slash latter portions of a romp through the vampiric lands of Steimharad. Um, On our Patreon, we've also recently added fiction tiers um, so that people can enjoy lovely fiction rewards. Honey, didn't people with fiction tiers recently get something amazing? We just got access to Story Magic, so the new novella coming out June 1st, they can access right now. Well, Same thing will be true for Amber Queen. So when I finish it, I'll get it a couple months before it releases too. Nice. You can check out all of our lovely stuff over at patreon.com slash Grove Radio Press. Honey, thank you for talking about settings with me. You're so welcome. Thank you. Um, We'll see everybody on Tuesday for Tales of Eldura. Oh, yes. Where we're going to talk to Maddie, the night hag in the center of... No? You've been reading the book. I have not. That's not who it is, but yeah, she looks like her name is Maddie the Night Hag, but that's not who she actually is. Okay. I saw the token that said, I saw the token that had the Night Hag on it. It's just, this is the token that was there. Okay. (laughs) Well, we'll figure out what the heck Maddie is on Tales of Eldura on Tuesday at 8 p.m. Until next time, friends. Thank you very much. And have a beautiful evening. Everybody.